Hello everyone, this is Grandmaster Josh Fidel, and today I'm continuing with my autopsy series. Last week I was teaching uh, at a camp, so I decided to take the week off, but hopefully you guys are ready for another video. So today I decided to do something a little bit different with the video. I mean, it's the same concept. I take one side who lost and I dissect why they lost and how it happened. But I'm actually using a classic game today rather than a game that just occurred or that was recent. And I actually think this is an interesting thing to do with classical games because a lot of classical games people know and have memorized even and have learned from them before. But one of the things I've noticed is that we always look at it from the winning side. How did the winning side, how, did, how were they victorious? What can we learn from their great play and all of this? But I actually think that looking at it from the losing side can be just as interesting and also just as teachable because it's really, you know, why these great players lost can also be just as just as big. It can also apply to us in our own games. So this one was the third round of the 1972 World Championship between Boris Spassky and Bobby Fischer. Probably a lot of you have seen this game before. If you've studied the classic games, it's almost surely one that you would have seen. And the main reason for that is that, I mean, it was a big turning point game. I don't know how many of you know this, but Spassky actually won the first two games in this World Championship match. Now, we know how it ended with a decisive Fisher victory, but to go down 0-2 is actually quite something. And had Spassky won this game, he would have been up 3-0. And I know that Fisher is an amazing player, and maybe he would have won anyway, but that's a pretty big deficit, a pretty big blow uh, to, as we say, Longcastle, to start with three zeros. Um, but let's see how it happened from Spassky's point of view. Spassky was white in this game. He had won the first two games, was probably brimming with confidence, more or less. So what went wrong for him? So he played d4, knight f6, c4, and Fisher played a Benoni. Now, could have been partially some surprise. It could have been he wanted to really mix up the game because he could really use a win at this point. Although some, some players, after losing two in a row, will try to stop the bleeding. I think that Fisher was maybe a one who took chances and wanted to recapture it with a win. Uh, something which actually our current world champion, uh, Magnus Carlsen, likes to do, or at least he said he's liked to do. So it's all a matter of style, but in any case, he chose the Benoni. D5, take, take. D6, knight, C3. G6, knight, D2. For a long time, this was a very popular line. I actually think that it's a pretty good line. This followed by E4, bishop, D2. Bishop, E2. There's also knight, C4 ideas. It's not as common as bishop, F4 is these days, but I think it's a very nice line, actually. So knight, B, D7 was played. Probably bishop g7 looks more flexible to me, but there are different ver reasons why you'd put a knight on d7 first, largely to do with the fact that sometimes you want to counter knight c4 with knight b6. So it, there is a purpose to this move. e4, bishop g7, bishop e2, castles, castles, rook e8, all fairly logical moves. Queen c2. I would say that this move is not super popular, in, I'd say in large part due to this game. But, okay, it obviously can't be a terrible move, but in a lot of cases people will play moves like rookie 1, I believe is very popular here, a4 is a move, you have lots of different options here. Uh, but I don't want to get into the opening too much, he played queen c2. And here Fischer played a move which almost surely was quite a surprise to Spassky. Played knight h5. Now. Knight h5. Why is this such a surprising move? If any of you play the Benoni or know the Benoni, you're probably familiar with this idea. You, you allow bishop takes h5, you take back with the g-pawn, your pawn structure looks ugly, but you've secured the two bishops and often get counterplay, and it's usually very hard to attack this pawn. These days, this is known. At the time, this was a really unusual idea. And to face something like this over the board, a completely new idea, is not an easy thing to do. World Championship match, you do lots of preparation, you know, something happens, and then you're facing an unfamiliar move. Now, I would say that top grandmasters do much better in facing unfamiliar moves than amateur players. 
And a large part of it is that they try not to make assumptions. You face a move like this, it's easy to assume it's terrible. Like, oh my goodness, my opponent's allowing doubled pawns in front of their king. It has to be awful. And sometimes it is. But you never want to go in with that attitude. You want to go in with more, at least in my opinion, of an exploring attitude. Well, is it that bad? How weak are those doubled pawns? How weak is the king? What advantages does black get? And you determine whether you should challenge them or maybe say, you know what, knight h5 is a good move. I'm going to try something else. The, the nice thing for black here, though, is that if you don't take on h5, this move is probably just good. For example, if you play knight c4, and I play knight e5, if you're not planning on taking this knight, I've just helped myself out. Uh, as probably many of you know, trades in the Benoni tend to be good for black. Uh, the more trades, the merrier often. And if you play knight e3, of course, I can hop into f4, and now you really look silly. So... Ultimately, Spassky decided, in my opinion correctly, that he should take up the gauntlet. All right, show me these pawns aren't so weak. So H takes, G takes H5, Knight C4, and I think that Spassky, at least at first, played it very well. He One of the features of the pawn landing here is that the F5 square is a little bit vulnerable. So Spassky, after Knight E5, of course doesn't trade, which I think plays into Black's hands a little bit plays knight e3. So the idea is that now f5 is well under control, and the, the position seems to be more or less normal. So here, I don't know, if I were Fisher, I might have tried knight g4, just to make sure that these knights maybe get try to get them off the board, make sure f5 doesn't become too weak. He chose a move, which in my opinion is actually a mistake, although it might very well be one of the only mistakes he played all game. Uh, which is often how it works. You're playing Bobby Fischer, you don't expect too many gifts. But in my opinion, this move was actually not accurate. He played queen h4. So it looks a little scary, right? Your opponent puts a queen out in front of you. But once again, your job is to not make assumptions. Is this move actually doing anything? What is the idea? Uh, and of course, someone like Fischer, I, I would say one of the qualities of his play is that he's very direct. It's very rare he plays a move which is super subtle, where he's trying to toy with you you pretty much know what Fisher's up to most of the time. I mean, he's a very direct player. So he puts a queen on h4. He surely has a follow-up in mind. And I actually think that this was a key moment for Spassky where he really started to go wrong. Um, because in this position, I think that there's only one real follow-up to queen h4 that would worry me. And that move is knight g4. It threatens to trade the knights, and if you have to play knight takes g4 and pawn takes g4, then all of a sudden, well, you've improved black's pawn structure. The pawn on g4 doesn't look so bad. The queen on h4 still looks a little strange, but it can't be all that bad. So it's just kind of an annoying, an annoying thing. So here, if I were white, uh, I would really look to be playing a move like f3. H3, of course, is always going to be dangerous because of sacks. I, I really don't like that move. But F3 secures E4 a little bit. It's not a weakness just yet, but it's always kind of useful. It keeps the knight out. And now you can go about your business. You can play bishop D2. Next, just finish your development. Moves like queen F2 are always possible if you're super nervous, but it's very unlikely to be necessary. And quite honestly, I, I just don't know what this queen's doing here. So after F3, I actually really prefer white's chances. Um, and again, it's why I might have played knight g4 on the previous move for black, to, to ensure this doesn't happen. My guess would be that Fisher thought that after h3 takes takes, he's kind of helping white develop. But honestly, I think that it's really necessary to make sure that you get these open lines for the bishops. He can maybe play for f5 now. The, the position looks unclear. Instead, of course, uh, Spassky played a different move, which doesn't look horrible, and it can't be that bad of a move. He played bishop d2. But it turns out to be more or less of a wasted move. And it allows Black to compete to complete his one major idea. He plays knight g4. So here h3 has a major drawback, which is that after I trade, of course you take with the bishop. Now taking on h3 is at least in the air. And I don't know. Uh, there's also a problem that you can actually grab a pawn right away by taking this and then taking on e4, which is more more or less the reason why I think he didn't do this. So h3 here looks a little bit wrong, and f3 here, of course, runs into queen takes h2 mate, which is also not ideal. So knight takes g4 was played, h takes g4. 
Now, by itself, I don't think this is such a big deal. Yes, you've fixed your opponent's pawns. This is never something you want to do. But the fact is, it's not like this pawn is actually ideal. I mean, really, it would still rather be back on g6. Uh, black would rather have a much more solid setup than that. It's not like black's attacking, really. It's kind of an illusion that black is attacking just because the queen's here. But it's not horrible, and I would say that, you know, white hasn't done anything horribly wrong. Here he plays bishop f4, which is an improving move, but is clear that bishop d2 was essentially a loss of a tempo. Fisher takes the time to improve his queen. He likes to attack, but he's also certainly not an idiot. He realizes that his queen on h4 is slightly misplaced. He moves it back to f6. And this is where I think Spassky really loses the thread. This is going to sound a little bit over dramatic, but I actually think with his next move, he essentially just lost the game. That sounds too much. It sounds like, all right, Josh, you're off your rocker. But the fact is that after his next move, Spassky never plays an active move for the rest of the game. And that's usually not the right sign. It could mean that he didn't play aggressively enough later. But the fact is that his next move takes away any active plan he could have. So to me, there are three real choices here for white. You could play a move like queen d2, I suppose. That's not probably not a bad choice either. But the main choices are you either retreat the bishop to e3, you retreat it to g3, or you play g3 yourself. And I think the two of those choices are clearly poorer than the third. And the one he played, I actually like least. So what would you guys do? Take a moment to think if you're in the mood for thinking. Which, which one looks most appealing to you? I can tell you that, okay, bishop e3... This would be played with a note of sadness. You already went to d2, then e3, then f4, then e3. Your bishop's not active there. It, it doesn't really strike me as such an amazing move. Um, bishop g3 would likely be my choice. And the reason is very simple. I want to have an active idea. And this is something which I can tell you that for sure GMs are very into, but almost any player, if you don't have any active plan at all, it's really hard to play. There are, there are moments when you have to sit and just not make your position worse. Uh, I don't want to say that there aren't moments like this, but almost always you need at least some glimmer of hope. You need something to look for in the future, like, yes, I can accomplish this eventually and gain, make some gains, whether it's material, whether it's developing an attack, whether it's trying to queen a pawn. You need some future. And usually the future lies with on the part of the board where you're better. So if you look at this board, where does white have the advantage? Well, it's probably the center, and in particular this d6 weakness and also the maybe the central dark squares. So if I'm white, I feel like I need to get an e5 someday. And this is usually a goal in the Benoni. Now, okay, moves like knight b5 are certainly possible. Most likely, black should just play a move like bishop d7 here. My guess would be he was actually maybe afraid of a move like h5. And this is actually something that often will come in, come in uh, handy for a player, which is that F Fisher at this point, okay, he was 0-2 against Spassky. He actually had a bad score against Spassky, I believe, before this match even. But people were kind of afraid of him. I mean, he came out of nowhere. He was winning all these matches. He was winning all these tournaments. I mean, very fearsome player. And sometimes when you're playing a fearsome player, you can kind of trust them too much. Now, I actually highly doubt Spassky was guilty of this, but I'm just throwing it out there because definitely we've all made this kind of mistake before where we're just too afraid of someone, either based on their reputation or their rating, or they just look super scary, whatever works for you. But it's just a mistake. You have to play the position. You have to think about, okay, what exactly are they threatening here? So H4 is certainly a threat. But first of all, knight b5, I'd say, is at least worth exploring. But even if that's not possible, the move that I would refute this with is probably just a move like f3. Because now if h4, you're able to take here with tempo, so that kind of kills that idea. And if black takes on f3, this h5 pawn is not really that great. And you can probably play like rook takes and double rooks. Your position looks really nice, really natural. Black's king, I think, is a little bit weaker. The d6 pawn is weak. Like, certainly white's no worse. And in fact, I think white's just better. So probably black should play something like bishop d7. But now, at the very least, you can continue with your idea. You can play f4. You can aim for e5. Rook a1 maybe comes next. 
Uh, you could also play rook a e1 first if you felt like it, but I, I prefer to get in f4 right away so that e5 is already hovering over black's head. And again, the position is not that clear, but I don't think white can be worse here. White has an active plan and is ready to execute it. And it's not clear that black, you know, moves like b5. If you, white can get an e5, b5 is not all that fearsome, I don't think. So at the very least, it would give black troubles. It would give black something to worry about. And I think the course of this game, and then potentially, if you want to get really hypothetical, the whole world championship could have hinged on this decision. He played g3. Again, it's not like these light squares are horribly, horribly weak. I mean, it's not like a queen's going to land on f3, a bishop, uh, and a bishop on h3, and black's going to give checkmate and, like, you know, dance around the room or something. But the problem with this is that f3 is just not doing anything anymore. Like, how do you get it in? You just play f3 takes, and all of a sudden you have weak light squares everywhere. You're, you can't get an e5 anymore. F4 is no longer on the table. All of White's ideas, notice how also the bishop can't retreat. So if the, you want to get an F4, the bishop can't even stay on the diagonal. All of White's active ideas were basically snuffed out by this one move. And again, it may seem like this is just asking too much, but I almost think that he had no chance now. Granted, do I think he's dead lost here? Almost certainly not. If you try to beat a computer here, you're going to have problems. If you're facing really stern defense, you're going to have a tough time. But the fact is, if you can't play any active ideas and your opponent's moves are super simple, you're going to have problems. So from here on, Fisher just plays super well. Bishop d7 was played. Allowing b5 doesn't look all that great, so he plays a4. b6. b6 is a very slow move, but Fisher has no reason to be in a rush. And this is another problem with having no active plan. Your opponent can take all the time they need. And Fisher may be a direct player, but he's also a very patient player. And if he sees that he doesn't have to beat you right away because you're not threatening to do anything, he's going to play it slow. So rook e1, a6. And here already, I mean, at least from a human perspective, I don't know what to do. If you turn on a computer here, they might start suggesting random moves like rook a3 to b3, but this is not human. Humans know that this kind of thing almost never works. You still can play b5 after rook a3. You can maybe double rooks. It, it just looks ridiculous, right? And so a human being is not going to consider a move like this, and I'm not even convinced it's good. It's just something a computer might pop up. As far as human ideas, you're like, well, what do I do? b5 is coming. b5 is going to be very inconvenient. So one idea I had, the move that I found most natural, at least, was queen d3. Very simple, you're preventing b5. But once again, you have an issue of your opponent has ideas and you don't. So black could simply play a move like queen g6, and note how black doesn't even have to play this right away. Black can throw in moves like h5 if he feels like it helps. Black can do anything, because white just has no active idea, and now f5 is coming. So how do you deal with f5? Honestly, I, I don't have the answer. There might be an answer out there, but it's not one that I possess. And you can see now how, I mean, any kind of pushing pawns like f3 is just going to weaken the king. It's not going to help. a5 doesn't do anything because of b5. It just invites it. What is white going to do? White has absolutely no active answer to this f5 plan. So even though I'm preventing one idea, I'm simply allowing another. And there's nothing that white can do, at least that I can see. Again, Maybe if you take a long look at this position, you're going to find some other ideas. But I've looked, and quite honestly, nothing looks convincing to me here for White. So already, he finds himself in an impossible situation. And even the very strongest players, and Spassky was the world champion, he was as strong as anyone at this point, maybe apart from Fisher, that even he couldn't find a solution here. So he played rook e2, which is a very logical move. You have potentially black trying to play f5, so you double on the e-file. The problem, of course, is that now b5 comes, and there's nothing really you can do about it. But okay, he plays doubles rooks. b4 is not a huge threat here. And again, I think Fischer's play is very instructive. It's very straightforward, but at the same time, he's not in a rush. He's like, okay, I could play for b4, but why bother? You know, white maybe retreats the knight to b1, plays b3, knight d2, maybe establishes a blockade. Who wants that? So he's like, okay, I'll play queen g6. Improve the queen a little, tease you with f5 plans, b3, Spassky plays to keep an eye on all these pawns. Note how we, without the queen on f6, this knight is no longer hanging. 
And again, I, I really like Fisher's approach. He, you know, at first I was looking at moves like Rook AC8, trying to play C4, but Fisher is very, very simple. He's just like, look, you can't do anything. So I'm just going to double on the E-file myself. I'm going to ask you what you're doing. So I really wanted to break out as white here. I wanted to let loose. And at first I was actually going to consider Spassky's next move a mistake because he didn't take his chance. But the closer I looked, the more I realized nothing is going to work. And I don't know how much the players saw during the game. I'm guessing players of this caliber probably saw most of this. But I was wanting to play e5 because at least you're breaking out. You have an idea. You're trying to get out. If you can get away with this move, it looks excellent. The problem is I don't believe you can. Black can simply take, and there's not really much you can do with the queen hanging, so you probably have to take this queen, which is annoying because you improve black's pawns, but not much you can do. So probably you have to move your bishop, but your position is pretty lousy after that. Uh, d6 does absolutely nothing. You can just probably play your rook up. So I wanted to take this pawn, and at first I thought this was maybe playable. But again, simple chess. Rook e8, you have to take on g7. Black trades everything, all pretty forced. And I looked at this endgame, and I realized, oh, you're just dead. <laughs> the queen side is extremely weak. You can maybe take on b5, but after a, a takes, your this queen side is very strong. The king's running up to e5. Notice how white's king is worse than black's as well. Something that people sometimes forget when they evaluate, but how good your king is is often really crucial to who is better. In the end game, it's whose king can get to the center quicker. In a middle game position, it's whose king is safer, usually. Occasionally in the end game, it's whose king is safer too, by the way. But in this position, the king runs up to e5, white can basically resign. So Spassky plays queen d3, which is a better move, most likely. But it also doesn't really do much. Okay, Fischer defends his b-pawn. He prevents the, the, the doubling of the rooks, though, which is definitely an achievement. And he does this. But now he realizes that b4 is coming with bishop b5. That's going to be pretty nasty. His rooks are stuck defending the e-pawn. So he tries b4. This is actually a really, really nice try, in my opinion. And honestly, I think this move would be an, an, an excellent practical try, and a lot of people would lose their footing here. Uh, but Fisher reacts correctly. It's tempting to try to keep the position open for the bishop by taking but when the knight goes back to a2 and takes on b4 with knight c6 ideas, it actually creates some form of counterplay. So Fisher plays c4, which looks nice. You create a corrected passer. But oftentimes in the Benoni, and in any Benoni structure, if there's a knight here that is very solid, sometimes this pawn just doesn't do anything. Uh, so it's at least an attempt to keep black more passive. The problem is after queen d2, rook b8, you have, this pawn is just super weak. And honestly, white can do almost nothing here. Notice how there's no pawn breaks. There's no, the pieces are as good as you're going to get them. And when your pieces are maximized and you still have no good moves, that's usually a sign something's gone extremely wrong for you. And again, I mean, such a strong player. Uh, I mean, <laughs> world champion, like one of the best. And he still just is completely powerless here. And it has nothing to do with his play in the last several moves. He's played, as far as I can tell, he hasn't really done anything too wrong. It was all based on the two decisions, one of allowing knight g4 and one of allowing g3, of playing g3. And again, note how it's not f3 and h3 being weak. It's just that you can't do anything now. There's no f pawn advance. There's no nothing. So rook e3, h5. Again, Fisher could take this knight and take this pawn at some point, but he's in zero rush. So he's just making small improvements. Rook e2, notice how Spassky's sitting, because what else can he do? So here, Fisher gains time. He plays king h7, rook e3, king back, rook e2. I don't know if he was down or time went up or just wanted to kind of taunt him. All I know is GMs repeat a lot. It's a, it's, it's a nice little habit. Just make sure you don't do it three times when you're better. It's quite embarrassing. In any case, finally, Fisher decided enough is enough. He takes on c3. He decided now is the time to cash in his advantage. He gives up his star bishop, but he also wins a pawn. And from this point on, his technique is quite good. Um, it looks like a difficult pawn to win with opposite bishops, open kings, but for a player of Fisher's caliber, it's just not that tough. Spassky throws in a spite mate, spite mate thread, I should say, rather than a spite check. Queen g6, that's too bad. Bishop back, trying to play bishop b2. Fisher says, no, thank you. And from here on, there's just not a lot 
to be done. I, I would have maybe tried queen b2 with the idea of shooing the queen away again, then queen d2 trying bishop b2. Okay, it shouldn't work, it shouldn't be enough, but at least it would throw in, give him more chances. He tried to move his king out, but this just didn't work at all because black simply activated his bishop, threw in a check, so d-pawn is now hanging. He doesn't want to take it necessarily because it allows white to maybe ha throw in some checks and do some nasty stuff, so he just checks himself. Queen b3, bishop b3 check, and Spassky threw in the towel. If he goes to e1, this pawn hangs with check. If a move like king e3, you can probably just do this, and then this king is going to end up in lots of troubles. Basically, black's, ma black's mate or black's threats come a lot quicker than white's. So after bishop d3 check, he just resigned. So again, it's, it's quite an amazing thing that a player could fall seemingly only after two mistakes. But sometimes if you... Make a move like g3, and you put yourself in a situation where you don't have any active ideas, you can lose extremely badly. And again, it's not a mark of a weak player or anything like that, but it's important to avoid decisions which do this. So one of the key things you can do is ask yourself always, what is my idea? How can I improve my position? How can I hurt my opponent? If you have no answer to this, if you have no long-term idea, you probably are in a rough spot, and it's something you'd rather avoid. So making sure you don't make decisions like this is a really important thing. The other thing I wanted to point out was notice how black, white's mistakes came after, actually after an inaccurate move, at least in my opinion, of Fisher's, queen h4. Queen h4 wasn't necessary. After f3, white could have been better. But this is something I find is very common among club players and grandmasters, which is that you're more likely to make a mistake after an opponent mistake meaning that they made a move that's a mistake. It's likely not expected. Sometimes that means that people don't think clearly. They, they either assume the move is better than it is, they assume that they have to take advantage of the move in some way, or in this case, it seemed like Spassky almost ignored the move, but the move did carry one positional idea, which was knight g4, trading the knights, fixing the pawn structure. And while he didn't lose just from that decision, the whole course of play just did not favor him, and he clearly was not sure what to do with his position. So I guess the other advice about, about this kind of loss would be make sure after your opponent makes a mistake, whether you realize, you know, you might not realize it at first, but let's say you assume your opponent's made a mistake, that's when you got to take a little extra time. Don't get too confident. Actually figure out why is this a mistake? What can I do? Spot that F3 move, which really jammed black in that position. It's not always so easy to do. It's easy to make a mistake right after your opponent, but if you really take the time, realize it's a critical moment, that can do a lot for you. Move, as far as avoiding moves like g3, any any pawn move that could create weaknesses, you got to be think twice about. But as we saw, it wasn't so much about weaknesses, it was that it took away the active plan. So to make sure that you always have that active plan is going to save you a lot of grief. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this cold case version, I would call it, of autopsy. I'll be trying to turn these out once a week, obviously, if I'm away or busy or decide, eh, who cares about those viewers? I might not do one, but I'm definitely going to try to stick to this uh, once a week. Again, I'm going to be, you know, looking at comments, so definitely leave comments if you have anything constructive uh, to tell me or if you have just a suggestion for games, because I'm always looking for those. At some point, I might do a game myself, and I apologize in advance, but sometimes that can be useful. I'm definitely going to look up, do the classical game again if this one's popular. Uh, but just in general, let me know what you guys want to look at. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and I will see you next week.